Hey, what's up? How's it going? It's Rob and welcome to Leave Curious. Just before we begin real quick, I want to let you know that you can get your hands on a Leave Curious t-shirt. They're up there. I'm wearing one as well. I've designed them myself. You can get them in women's and like men's shapes and sizes. They come in a bunch of different colors and they are sustainably made too. So if you want to get one, I've linked it down in the description of the video. Sweet. So if the UK really wants to move towards a greener and a wilder future, it is essential that we rewild our agricultural lands as much as possible because they make up 72% of all UK land. In today's video, we're going to take a look at how UK farmland is currently being managed, some new policy changes which are in the process of being made, and then we'll take a look at some great examples of rewilding farmland here in the UK. So yes, a considerable 72% of UK land is dedicated solely to agriculture. And that 72% can be broken down into two broad categories, around 40% of which is arable land, arable being the farming of crops, and the remaining 32% is pastoral being the raising of animals. There are approximately 192,000 farms in the UK, but only 20% of those farms are over 250 acres. 250 acres is roughly 125 football pitches. The the remaining 80% are smaller and predominantly family run farms. So over the last century in the UK, almost every farm has aimed to be as productive as possible. And what that means is, is that every farm aims to produce the greatest quantity and the greatest quality of crops that they can, which means more food for the country and it means more money for the farmers. Yielding such results has often come at the degradation of our lands. The degradation of biodiversity through monoculture crops, reductions in the quality of soils and their structures, and a lack of connectivity in the landscape as woodlands, hedgerows and natural water bodies make way for larger agriculture fields. So up until the year 2020, the UK was part of the EU, which also meant it was part of CAP, which is known as the Common Agricultural Policy. CAP ensures that countries in the EU receive payments to maintain high quantities and a variety of foods for the people of Europe. Ever since its creation in 1962, its number one aim is to maximise production. So as well as the degradation of land, CAP also led to undistributed funding amongst farmers. The payments from CAP are hectare based, meaning if you're a bigger farm, you'll receive more money. Considerations of ecologically friendly or sustainable farming is not considered in the payments. So this just means that the smaller farmers just can't compete, they can't make a living and it leads to rural abandonment and just less people living and working in the countryside. But it also means that the bigger farmers can take centre stage and they can take full control, intensifying agriculture and degrading the ecosystem. These intensified processes incorporate unsustainable practices. Larger farmers do this to of course maximise production, but also the smaller farmers are forced to do this just to survive. And due to the initial aim to maximise production, along with a lot of waste, surplus foods are exported to developing countries where they are sold at a fraction of the price which crushes the local and rural economies of these countries who just can't compete. So CAP, CAP just doesn't seem that good, does it? Not least for biodiversity and the ecosystem, but also for smaller farmers. Not only the smaller farmers within the countries where it's operating, but also those farmers where we export to. And I think when you look at that statistic that around 80% of farms in the UK are smaller and family run, it just seems like CAP just isn't suited to our country. However, due to Brexit, the UK has now been forced to leave CAP. We're phasing it out over the next several years and in its place, the UK has developed the Agriculture Act, which has some very exciting policies. And one of which is known as ELM, which stands for Environmental Land Management. And the main aim of ELM is to incentivize to pay farmers to manage their land in an eco-friendly and sustainable way. It has three core areas that provide incentives for farmers and landowners. All right, so let's do a quick overview of what these different tiers promise. Tier one, sustainable farming incentives. So this will be things like the management of livestock to prevent overgrazing or potentially the margins of fields to make them better for biodiversity and wildlife or potentially the efficient use and storage of water. Tier number two, 
local nature recovery. This tier is geared towards funding a wide range of actions that will benefit the local environment. It's all about understanding the local ecosystem and what it needs and therefore the farm's context within that system. So this tier will pay for the creation of habitats such as woodlands or for wet woodlands or for grasslands or for coastal habitats. It will also include funding for species management including reintroductions, introductions and translocations but it's also going to pay for services for people so whether if that's through amenities or for education. And tier three, landscape restoration. Now this tier is the really exciting one if you're into rewilding. It not only encourages farmers with large amounts of land to take part, but also neighboring landowners to collaborate. This tier will fund large scale habitat creation, including woodlands, peatlands, and coastal habitats like wetlands and salt marsh. So yeah, Elm, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And it will begin to roll out at the end of 2021 with around a thousand agreements. And then again in 2024, there'll hopefully be around 5,000 agreements, but it is being launched as a pilot scheme. There's loads of tests and trials currently going on. So until this scheme matures and more farmers can join, what can they do in the meantime? Well, the UK already has the Countryside Stewardship Scheme. This scheme pays farmers and landowners to manage their land and to look after the environment, providing funding to create new hedgerows and to install electric fences. The main elements of the scheme are mid-tier, higher tier, wildlife grants, capital grants and woodland grants. So I don't want to lose you in all of the particulars, but the higher tier focuses on environmentally significant areas such as a triple SI, whereas mid tier offers more simple yet effective environmental benefits and measures to improve aspects of running the farm. Wildlife offers help to protect wildlife and preserve the natural environment, and this system is designed so that these offers can be applied quickly and simply. But yeah, so you've got woodland creation grants, which is quite self-explanatory. You've also got capital grants, which include like a whole range of things from like boundary management to like air quality management. In 2024, when Elm fully rolls out, it is going to take the place of countryside stewardship. Although Elm is relatively new and is going through a pilot launch with lots of tests and trials, when compared to the countryside stewardship scheme, the main differences that I can see is that Elm is a more holistic approach to managing the land. In that it considers the various scales of different farms from small to large and what they can do with their land, you know? And the tier systems themselves, they seem to build from one another, starting small and getting bigger. And they're all geared towards managing the land, farming sustainably and in a regenerative way and sometimes moving away from farming altogether through landscape restoration, you know, building large natural habitats. That's rewilding. It does sound prom promising, but there's a long way to go. Only time will tell. All right, thanks for sticking through that bit on policy. It can be kind of boring, but it is super important. And to reward you, I now want to go through all of the awesome things which are happening in the UK with respect to farming and rewilding. It would be rude not to start with showing you NEP estate. Run by Charlie Burrell and Isabella Tree, the Nepa estate has radically evolved under their care. After taking over the farm in the early 1980s, Charlie Burrell was faced with a farm on tremendously difficult soils for farming, and for 17 years he worked very hard to run a productive farm. However, being unable to compete with the larger farms on better soils, Charlie decided to take a completely different approach and in the year 2000 he sold his dairy herds and his farming machinery. It took a lot of gumption and belief but the estate began to take on a new process led vision, a vision which seeked to enable nature to take the driving seat. The site was awarded high level stewardship funding in 2010, remember that's the one for sites of keen environmental interest. So what's happened since that decision to sell the farm machinery back in the year 2000? Well, you know, it's been a huge success. It's not only shown what rewilding can do for biodiversity, the landscape, but it's also shown what it can do for the people that are running that business. And what's worked so brilliantly at restoring biodiversity at NEP is grazing ecology. The Dutch ecologist Dr. Franz Vera's studies and subsequent book, Grazing Ecology and Forest History, really acted as a catalyst in NEP's revival. It's the different grazing techniques and disturbance that is caused by large herbivores that have such profound benefits to the land. So many of these large herbivores have been lost. They've particularly been lost from the UK and the process that has been lost there is that battle between animal disturbance and vegetative succession that creates a complex and biodiverse habitat. 
The grazing animals you'll find include longhorn cattle, Tamworth pigs, Exmoor ponies, fallow red and roe deer. Along with the work of these grazing animals, natural water systems have been restored, creating dynamic aquatic habitats. Rare species such as turtle doves and purple emperor butterflies are now breeding at NEP, as well as more common species flourishing. You know, NEP is not only a great example of how quickly agricultural land can be restored for biodiversity, but it's also an example of how a previously unproductive farm can provide an array of ecosystem services as well as new economic opportunities, engaging with the public, allowing general walking access, but also through NEP wildland safaris and camping. Another important and relatively new way that they're managing the land at NEP is regenerative agriculture. Unlike intensive agriculture where the rulebook is both pretty straightforward and immensely damaging, regenerative agriculture is diverse and always starts with surveys to best understand the land at hand. But some common practices include allowing plants to break up the soils and then to allow for worms to transfer the nutrients between the soils rather than like heavy tilling and plowing. You have mob grazing which is where livestock is reared on selective patches of land which allows for the land to grow and regenerate, not only sequestering carbon but also providing habitat for wildlife. Agroforestry is another really interesting part of regenerative farming. Now, whether if they're doing this at NEP now, I don't know, but the way that agroforestry works is you allow for the native trees to grow on a site and the site, the forest, the area can be thought of different layers and these layers start off on the ground layer all the way up to the vines that grow on the tallest of trees and the idea with agroforestry is that you're able to harvest from each of these layers so not only is it a functioning and natural system you're also able to harvest from that you know I'm sure that there's many smaller farmers with unproductive land that look to nap with inspired eyes but you know, generally, I am feeling really positive about agriculture here in the UK moving forward. I do think it would be naive to expect every farm to conform to these new environmental policies and for, you know, every farm to do everything they can for rewilding. I think every farm should be doing what they can, but you know, as a population, we're growing, we need food. And it's really important that the UK can be as self-sufficient as possible moving forward. But I think we can move forward in a way with these new environmentally led schemes which are going to give power to not only the bigger farms as well but also to the smaller farmers who can like, you know, not only be productive but also find like a new way of making money that isn't just the traditional way of just like planting crops and raising livestock, you know, to give farmers that encouragement to know that they can not only manage the land sustainably and environmentally but also make a bit of money out of it too. And yes, I know that a lot of these schemes are in their infancy, but it steps in the right direction. You know, I really think that over the next 50 years, the UK has a real opportunity to become a flagship country, not only in environmentally friendly agriculture, but also in rewilding generally. Don't forget to check out the t-shirts. Links in description. As always, thanks for watching. Leave curious. It's gonna take the place of countryside stewardship. It's going to take the place of countryside stewardship. And Elm fully rolls out, country stewardship is going to be left behind. <laughs>